I thank everyone for coming. Um, I think we should turn this speaker series into uh, people who really don't need an introduction speaker series. <laughs> Uh, but I will give a, a, a brief introduction regardless. Uh, this is Tom Friedman, a famous writer, three Pulitzer Prizes, New York Times columnist. Uh, many of you all might not have realized that, that, that we, we know each other and, and that every morning we coordinate our outfits, um, <laughs> which, which is now. What are you wearing today, Sal? Yeah, I know, we're very, we're, we're very careful about that. Should we that. do pink today? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but but it's 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 a real honor uh, to, 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 uh, to have you mm. here and 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 where I like to start is I mean a lot of people know you as like the public person and and I do this really for a lot of frankly a lot of people who just might be watching Khan Academy young students or whatever and, and I'm always curious how a Tom Friedman becomes a Tom Friedman hmm. I mean what what brought you on this path um, so it's interesting I grew up in uh, I was born in Minnesota um, I grew up in St Louis Park a small suburb of Minneapolis. Yeah, I think uh, I've always thought to be a successful columnist, and whether I am or not, someone else can judge. But it's really important to be from somewhere. So uh, it's really important to be grounded in in a in a worldview that you take around the world and you measure against other things you see. And so the thing you have to understand about my column is I'm always looking for Minnesota. Yeah. So what does that mean? It means I grew up in Minnesota at a particular time when politics really sort of worked. Yeah. So I graduated from high school in 1971. And that was the year uh, that Walt, uh, that our, sorry, our governor, Sandy, um, uh, I forgot his last name now, um, Anderson, um, was on the cover of Time Magazine holding up a walleye under the a head, a walleye fish. A, a walleye, I don't a know. A walleye fish, yeah, it's a Minnesota okay. fish. Oh. Um, uh, under the headline, um, Minnesota, the state that works. Mm. So I grew up in a in totally liberal district. And my whole life, my congressmen were two liberal Republicans, mm. not Democrats. My senators growing up were Walter Mondale, Eugene McCarthy, and Hubert Humphrey. Wow. The companies I grew up with were Dayton Hudson, Target, Honeywell, 3M, who thought it was part of their responsibility to do corporate social responsibility, to build the sympathy, to fund education programs. So it gave me, I now only realize in retrospect, a very powerful sense of that politics is something that can work, that communities can come together. And so when I later you know, went to the Middle East or Beirut or whatever, I carried that with me. And a lot of what I saw was, I, would say I saw communities falling apart. Right, Somebody right. else may have said something else. So um, my life changed in, in 10th grade. I had a great teacher. Yeah. Um, and her name was Hattie Steinberg. And she taught journalism in room 313 at St. Louis Park High School. <laughs> and um, her class is still the only journalism course I've ever taken. Uh, not because I'm that good, but because she was that good. It's the only one I ever needed. And she really inspired me to, to want to be a journalist and, and, and a writer. And in that same year, my parents um, took me to Israel um, on a trip to visit my sister who was going to school there. I had never been out of the state of Minnesota. Mm. I was 15, except for a few brief forays into Wisconsin. And I had never been on an airplane. <laughs> and so that was my first trip. I came to the Middle East, came to Israel, and I was just kind of blown away. So I actually lived on a a kibbutz all three summers of high school. I got totally fascinated with the Middle East, dropped yeah. everything, and was just totally absorbed with journalism and the Middle East. Um, and uh, I then went to college. I started taking Arabic as a freshman. Mm -hmm. I eventually did a semester at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, a semester at the American University in Cairo. And I graduated in, uh, in 1975 from Brandeis, ultimately, in, in Middle East studies. And I had a Marshall Scholarship to study Arabic and Middle East history, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, um, uh, in, in England. I did my first year at the School of Oriental and African Studies, and I went to Oxford and sort of had a classic British Arabist education at St. Anthony's. But while I was in London, um, I, then, I met my then girlfriend, now wife, mm -hmm. um, uh, Anne Buxbaum, and, um, who was a Stanford grad who graduated a year early, and kind of, she said, told her dad, you owe me a year of college, so she decided to go <laughs> to the LSE for a year. And uh, we met through mutual friends in London, and my real journalism career started because um, this was 1975. And we were walking down a street in London, and you know, the Evening Standard newsstand, um, they always have that blaring headline, you know, um, Brad to Jen, we're finished, you know, <laughs> <laughs> buy the evening paper. And um, we were walking down the street in London, and I saw the headline on the Evening Standard, and it said, Carter to Jews, colon, if elected, I promise to fire Dr. K. And I, I stopped and looked at that, and I said to my then girlfriend, now wife, isn't that interesting? This guy's running for president, Jimmy Carter. He's trying to win Jewish votes yeah. by promising to fire Henry Kissinger, the first ever Jewish secretary <laughs> of state. So how could that be? 
And um, that's sort of how my mind works. And I have no idea what possessed me, yeah. but I went back to my dorm and I wrote a column about it. Mm. And um, I, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, really liked it. And um, she is from Des Moines, Iowa. She took it home on uh, spring or winter break, I don't remember now, and um, gave it to a family friend named Gilbert Cranberg, who is the editorial page editor of the Des Moines Register, a wonderful Midwest paper at that time, and he liked it, and he printed it on their op-ed page, wow. half the op-ed page, under an Outh cartoon, and they paid- Outh cartoon? Outh, Outh. Uh, Outh, Outh uh, yeah, Outh. Uh, a cartoonist. Oh, oh uh, yeah. I mm -hmm. Alf. I under an Outh cartoon. Wrong time frame. Yeah, and, um, and they paid me $50. Wow. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. <laughs> I was walking down the street. I had an opinion. Yeah. I went and wrote it. I gave it to someone and they paid me $50. People pay for this. And I just thought I was hooked ever after. So during my time at Oxford, I wrote op-ed columns about the Middle East yeah. for the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, my hometown paper, where I also knew the editorial page editor, and for my wife's, then girlfriend, wife's yeah. hometown paper. So I graduated from Oxford in 78, um, and I had a wonderful time there. I studied with Albert Hurani, a great Arab historian, a wonderful man. Um, and uh, so I went to apply for a job, and I decided I was apply. A friend of mine, I, I applied at AP once in London, so I applied for a job at the Associated Press and United Press International mm -hmm. in London. And um, the uh, AP said, you've, 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 you've never covered a fire. You've never covered a city hall meeting, but I had a dozen op-ed <laughs> columns okay, from the Middle East. And um, UPI, kind of being Avis and AP being Hertz, said, look, the kids never covered a fire. But if you could do this, we could probably teach them that. And there's just been a revolution in Iran, and they think they, they use the same kind of letters as they do in the Arab world. <laughs> and um, a bunch of squiggles, and if you knew the Arabic stuff, maybe yeah. we could teach them to do that. And so they hired me for $200 a week on Fleet Street. And um, I worked there for almost a year when the number two man in the Beirut Bureau of UPI got shot in the ear by a man robbing a jewelry store on Hamra Street. And he called the headquarters and said, I, I want to get out of here. I do not want to pass go. I do not want to collect $200. Get me out of here. But where was and, this? Uh, this was in, in Beirut. In Beirut, right. The Civil Beirut. War started. So he got shot of, in the ear. In the ear by a man robbing a jewelry store, actually. In a jewelry store. And um, so they, UPI came to me and said, uh, do you want to go to Beirut? And you are like 20. I'm 25. 25 yeah. years old. And um, uh, they said, I've never been to Beirut. I've been to Egypt, never right. been to Beirut. So I turned to my then wife. There's a civil and, uh, war going on. Civil war. It's civil the middle of civil war. Beirut. Just yeah. started in 75. So this was now, it's well into its third year. This was 79, um, fourth year actually. And um, we just said, this is our moment and uh, got to go. And your wife and went. So, uh, yeah. And she, she, uh, she signed up. Um, uh, and so we went off to Beirut. And my first night there at the Commodore Hotel, I. I heard a gunshot fired. I really, that was the first time I'd ever heard a gunshot in my life. That's and um, uh, you didn't hear a lot of those in St. Louis Park. <laughs> and um, uh, so we were in Beirut for two years. Civil War had a very profound experience, a, a searing experience on me because um, what is, uh, and I don't mean this in a voyeuristic way, but when you're in one of those situations, you see how molecules behave at very high temperatures. So what you see is what people are capable of for both good and ill for good and evil in a way you'll never see in any normal environment. So the whole color spectrum goes out to here. Yeah. And you learn an enormous amount about people and about yourself. So I did that for two years and then the New York Times hired me. Went back to New York for uh, about 11 months as their correspondent, uh, sorry, as a business correspondent covering oil. And then they sent me back to Beirut in April 1982. Now I realize that date doesn't mean anything to anyone in this room, who they weren't born then. Um, but uh, Israel invaded Lebanon six weeks later. And the Lebanon story became the biggest story in the world. Um, and so I covered the Israeli invasion, the Marines coming, the Marines going, the US Embassy bombing, Sabra and Shatila, the massacres, um, all the journalists. I covered the Hama massacre in Syria, which was the precursor to what's going on now. And maybe the most important you know, experience of that, because we're, we're just at the um, uh, uh, 20th anniversary, sorry, 30th anniversary uh, of the U.S. Embassy bombing. And it's quite important, and it's doubly important for what I'll, I'll share with you. So and on, uh, I think it was April 18th, you can check the date, um, 1983, uh, I was sitting in my apartment in Beirut, in West Beirut, and uh, I had a little uh, a transistor radio on my desk. That was something that was used back then in the dark ages um, to actually listen yes. to the BBC. That's, no, how I, no, I that's how I got my yes, news. Yes, and, yes. Um, 
and there was a, there was a blast so powerful that um, it actually knocked the radio off my desk, like an yeah. earthquake almost. Yeah. And so I did what journalists do back then. I, I um, uh, just ran down to the street and, um, to do two things. One is the Israelis set off a lot of sonic booms by supersonic jets over Beirut. So a sonic boom sounds a lot like a, a car bomb or anything. Right. You don't know that. And so the first thing you listen for are sirens. Mm. If it's a sonic boom, you won't hear sirens. Mm. If, it's not, if you hear sirens, it's bad. And I quickly saw a mushroom cloud curling up in the distance mm. and a big one. And so I just ran toward it. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's what we do, that's, you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and um, I got closer and closer and said, uh, uh, oh, and it could, couldn't be. Um, it, it could, no, no, it could. And I sort of rounded the turn at the American University in Beirut, and there was the U.S. Embassy, which I used to live across the street from, cut in half like a doll's house. Um, bodies hanging out, you know, papers, desks, uh, a smoldering, smoking ruin. And staggering around um, was a young political officer named Ryan Crocker, wow. who I actually spoke to today because Ryan later became ambassador to Beirut, to Syria, to uh, 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 Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I don't remember if it was him or someone else, but I said, what happened? And um, they said a man drove a truck. You remember, U.S. Embassy in those days had no perimeter. Wow. You just walked up to the front door. Right. A man drove a truck through the driveway, up the front stairs, into the lobby, and blew it up. And I'll never forget what I said. You mean he blew himself up? Yeah. You mean he committed suicide? Right. That was unheard of. That was, un I mean, I, I literally, I could not get my mind around it. And that was the beginning. That right. was the first one. Um, and uh, that's really where the phenomena started. So anyways, I did two more years in Beirut for the New York Times, and it was, a, it was a remarkable, um, remarkable in the sense of the, the, just see the human drama that played yeah, out. I, mean, just, I, I have a, 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 about eight million questions Please. in my brain. Uh, from, but I mean, especially you know, when you hear about war correspondents, people who are in these war zones, I mean, did you, I mean, your, and your wife's there with you? Yeah. Did you fear for your life? I mean, you could go back to wherever, New York, yeah. Yeah. Minneapolis, um, hang out at the Target, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you right, Wall of America, it wasn't right. built then. Um, so um, there were times that, um, I came to Beirut in April 1982, the war started in June. Um, and unfortunately in the first week of the war, um, massive number of refugees came up from the south, mostly Palestinian. My driver in Beirut was a Palestinian, um, and he'd worked for the time since the 50s. He actually was a driver for Kim Philby. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Mohammed had seen like it all. And um, uh, we be he began to fear for my safety because uh, refugees were taking over apartments, that any vacant apartment. Mm -hmm. And this was summer, so a lot of Beirutis had gone uh, to, you know. A lot of people just walk, break in. Out. Break in, empty move apartment, in. move in. Yeah. Um, and so he chose, he decided to move his wife and two daughters into my apartment and move me into the hotel. He thought it would be much safer for me. And um, uh, tragically, uh, two groups of refugees got in a fight over my building and the one that lost blew it up. Wow. Um, and uh, so the building was completely destroyed and unfortunately my driver's wife and two daughters were killed in my apartment. Oh my and that was in the first week of the war. Um, and uh, so, you know, that was obviously, I could have been there. My wife hadn't come over yet. Um, you know, I really, you know, people always ask you that, and I honestly don't uh, think about it. I, I remember once being out to interview Arafat when Israelis bombed the neighborhood, and I just remember that when a big concussion bomb hits, how it sucked all the oxygen out of the air. Um, I was once walking around Beirut Airport with the Marines when a ricochet um, uh, came over our heads, and when a ricochet, because the ricochet slows down a bullet, you can actually hear it turning. Wow. when it gets closer to you. Yeah. So I, I remember those kind of things, but you know, most of the time I, I tried to be prudent. People say, do you have a bulletproof vest? And my motto is, if you need a bulletproof vest, you're somewhere you shouldn't be. Right. Because you, you, there's no sense in getting yourself killed. So I, I tried to be uh, as prudent as I could. I still did some crazy ass things, but um, I used to walk home at night um, <laughs> at, after work at 11, which I still can't believe. And um, I wrote about this. I wrote a book ultimately about, about yeah, yeah, Beirut no, to I, Jerusalem. Yeah. And, um, uh, there was a time where I was walking home at night with my wife. I bought that as a teenager. Yeah, really? So that's know, great. I, yeah, no, I, I, yeah. uh, after a movie, and we were walking down the streets of Beirut, and a man jumped out a window 
um, with a pistol in his hand and literally landed like right in front of us. And I used to say Beirut was so dangerous at night, you could walk home because even the criminals were afraid to be out. <laughs> and, um, but he looked at us and we looked at him yeah. and he just went away. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> oh my God. we're just like, but yeah. it was always like Batman, you know, jumped out. Um, but, but basically, um, we tried to be prudent. Um, we obviously saw some many tragic th scenes. I, uh, as a, that kid from St. Louis Park never had to help dig his driver's wife and two daughters out of the rubble of an apartment. So it was a searing experience for me. And um, uh, you hold a lot of stuff in, because I was there for the New York Times. It was my first assignment for the Times. The city was under siege. They couldn't get more reporters in, so they were stuck with me. And, um, uh, but at the end of the summer, um, I, uh, my deal with the Times was that I'm going to stay here. I was in the South when Israel invaded, and I'm going to stay here till the PLO leaves. That was the negotiation. The PLO is going to leave, you know, whatnot. And because um, I wanted, you know, in your career at the New York Times, if you write one six column headline story for the New York Times, right. that's a big deal. Right. I probably had eight that summer. Right. You know, these were, and I wanted to have. Israel invades and war ends, you know what I mean? I was just, you know, I was gonna stick right. it out. So um, the day finally came that the PLO left and I always give this as a lesson to young journalists. Um, it was a Saturday. I went down to the port to watch them go in trucks, get on these boats to Greece and Tunisia and whatnot. And I actually was with Peter Jennings, the late Peter Jennings from ABC. And I remember because we were standing there and the Palestinians were all shooting the, you know, in the air and um, uh, we were covered in shell cases. It's just wow. one of my searing memories. But it was an amazing scene, and it'd been there all summer, and it was just the culmination of the whole thing. And um, I went back to the Reuters Bureau, which is where I worked, and um, just one of those noisy old-time newsrooms, which I love. Um, by the way, those days, um, uh, you worked on something. It was called a typewriter, okay? <laughs> and um, so I worked on an Adler. I was so proud I had a German typewriter. Um, I actually got blown up, but um, I got another <laughs> one. And um, uh, I'm in the Reuters Bureau, working on my typewriter, the way you wrote stories back then, the way you wrote your news story, you had to write it three paragraphs at a time, hand it to a telex operator. They punched it into telex tape, and then it was telex to the New York Times, came out as telex tape, and they fed it into a computer, and that, then it was edited. That's how it all worked. Um, try writing a story three paragraphs at a time. Yeah. So you have to write the whole thing through, because you've got to know where you're going, yeah. then write it through again, and then you kind of write it through and, and hand yeah. it in. So I, I, uh, I'm, it's but Saturday, it's about three o'clock, I'm doing this, I'm writing. This is my last, this is the culmination of yeah. the whole summer. And all the communications from Beirut to the rest of the world went down. Wow. The, somebody basically either unplugged the PTT, because they all went through one PTT line, Post Telecron and Telegraph, um, and uh, no, no cell phones then, no nothing. So the entire communications between Beirut and the rest of the world were cut down. I still today have the telex tape in a shoebox of my last story from Lebanon. I stayed by the telex all night to see if it would come on. It never did. And that Sunday morning, under a six column headline, said Palestinians evacuate Beirut, Associated Press. Wow. And what I always tell young journalists about that is that um, it's really my view of life, which is that. It's all about the journey, not about the destination. <laughs> I love the movie Moneyball yeah. because you just got to enjoy the show. And sometimes you don't have the headline, you don't have the thing, but um, I don't mean enjoy a war, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, just, no, it's, you've a, just it's gotta, a very real experience. You've just got yeah. to be satisfied by the experience because sometimes the, the PTT goes down. <laughs> um, you know. and, and you never had an experience like that gentleman who got his ear shot, where you're just like, I've um, had no, enough, I'm getting out of here. Um, no, you know, I never, um, you know, you do get, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not some super guy, I mean, I just, you do get hardened to it, though. You try to be prudent. I mean, in Beirut to Jerusalem, I talked about a scene where I was with a colleague um, uh, who they did get into to Beirut at one point, and he was very jittery and nervous about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I was working on my story on deadline, um, and we're at the Reuters Bureau, and there was a man shooting at another person in the park across the street. And he came over to me, he said, did you see that guy there? And he had the gun in his gut, and he was shooting at him like this. And I just looked up, I said, Bill, was he shooting at you? Okay, all right. <laughs> Mind your own business. Because if he wasn't <laughs> shooting at you, I am on deadline, okay, <laughs> all right? And, um, uh, and I, I don't mean, I, honestly, it was not like some, but you're just really 
focused about what you do, you know. And um, and I tried. I was not. People did much crazier things than me. I just not did not, you know. Um, I try to take care of myself, but obviously you're, you're in a dangerous situation. Just by being in Beirut, you're in a dangerous situation. But, you know, I'll tell you, Sal, the people I went through that with, I go back to Lebanon pretty much once a year still, because they are among my closest and dearest friends, because we were all on the Titanic together. You know, and the yeah. friends I have who I went through Beirut with are like no friends I have. I, there's another story from Beirut to Jerusalem that I love to tell, because we had a our local reporter, the New York Times, a guy named Ihsan Hijazi, a brilliant Palestinian um, reporter and a real teacher of mine. And um, he tells a story in the book because Israelis were bombing Beirut all the time then. And one point they were in their living room, you know, just waiting for the bombing to end and with a candle going on, and a mouse appeared. And it was like he and his wife were up on the couch. You know what I mean? <laughs> like fear, you can be afraid of funny things, you know what I mean? Like, the bombing is coming, they can be obliterated any moment, but that mouse scared the daylights out of them. You know? And so you, you get just really funny things, like uh, you, you, you don't have experiences like that anywhere else, where you learn so much about human nature. And so um, I was there for, over the course of five years, I was there, there probably four full years, so I went back for the New York Times, and the Times said, hey, do you want to go to Jerusalem? So the New York Times had never had a Jewish reporter in Israel. It was a rule of the paper. And they, they tried to change that rule with my predecessor, David Shipler, but they discovered after they appointed him that he just looked Jewish, but he wasn't actually Jewish, okay? <laughs> and um, so they um, uh, didn't make that mistake with me, and, and they said, you've already done Beirut, not do Jerusalem. And no one had ever done that before, so I thought that'd be kind of interesting. So I did that for five years. And that was um, a very different experience. The boundaries, you know, were much yeah. narrower. You know, the color spectrums you, did, you didn't have. And um, I did that, and then I took a year off. I wrote from Beirut to Jerusalem. Then I, um, uh, when I got back to Washington, they said, whoever becomes the next president, you will be the chief diplomatic correspondent. Oh. So I, um, it turned out to be George Bush, the elder. Yeah. He named Jim Baker Secretary of State. And so after my year off writing this book, I became the chief diplomatic correspondent and um, you traveled been with- like Secretary of State yourself. No, <laughs> hardly. I actually, I, I not, not only should I not, it's not false modesty in the least, I didn't know anything about anything other than the Middle East. Right, and, right. Um, uh, so I got a great education traveling with Baker. First nine months was really boring. And I'm thinking, I gave up covering a drama to covering right. a policy. Right. And I gave up covering a street to covering a hall. Right. Like, what did you do? And, um, and then this, uh, this wall in, Be in, in Berlin came down. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. And yeah. suddenly I found myself traveling uh, 750,000 miles with Baker with a front row seat to the end of the Cold War. You were like in the plane. In the plane. He, ta he takes 10 uh, r reporters with him. Wow. And um, it was just an amazing front row seat to the end of the Cold War. So I felt like I was really lucky twice. Because yeah. in this business, if you're in the right place at the right time, one time, like you're lucky. And I thought this was really lucky. So I did that for four years. Great education. Then I, just very quickly, I, I was a chief White House correspondent for the first year of Bill Clinton. Wow. And that was Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, um, I have to tell you. <laughs> Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Um, uh, that was such a crazy ass experience, I gotta tell you. What um, was the, the craziest year, thing that you saw? I don't know, just saw. the Clinton White House was just, uh, they were fun and he was fun. And, um, and it was, uh, thank God I'm it was intrigued. the end of the Cold War, so it yeah. wasn't a serious time. No, you know? uh, yeah. um, so uh, nobody got hurt, you know. Yeah. Um, and this uh, is just the stuff that that you saw. That's right. Yeah, and I mean, I you're saw, like the press. It was, I mean, it was like, yeah. but I did that for a year. And covering the White House, it's an experience every journalist should have because it, it's a very interesting experience. Yeah. But none dare call it journalism. You know, yeah. it's sort of a cross between babysitting and stenography, you know, um, because you, uh, you're you there, but, you know, you got to go everywhere Who with the president. Who are you babysitting? Um, you're babysitting the president because oh, you, you, go you go wherever he goes, oh, really? you know, okay. like a so ball and chain. Really? Oh, wow. But yeah. you, you're, you take turns flying in Air Force One because it's a pool, you know, so. Yeah. So I was glad I did it for a year, but like I got the point after a year and said, I don't really want to do this because one of the things about covering the White House and the State Department is back in those days, again, the prehistoric days, um, the Washington Post and New York Times exchanged front pages at 10.30 every evening. So we saw what they had and they saw what we had. Really? And some type um, of like it was a little restraint mafia of, bosses mafia, restraint of trade, and, yeah. people don't realize. And if you're sitting at home, when you're covering the White House or the State Department, there's just one thing you don't want, a phone call at 1035, uh, okay? Because when the phone rings at 1035, you are 
only bad things are going to happen. What, that okay. the Washington Post is doing the, the same the, story? No, or? the editor says the Washington Post has a front page story that Jim Baker is about to announce this. And you have to start to match it at 10.35 at night. You haven't lived till you've called a senior administration official at home at 10.35 at night, okay, to match a Washington Post story. And so not only are you up till midnight matching their story, but you know when you come into the office the next morning, everyone knows they've got the lead story that you missed. Mm. Okay. So um, anyways, that's just part the, of the prehistoric age, you know, basically. Um, no Twitter then. So they would coordinate not to be embarrassed. Exactly. That's why they should. We would give like, each other a chance to match each other's story, right. but with the codicil that it said, um, as reported in the Washington Post first, oh, you know, so right. you had to kind of eat that crow, you know, yes, before yes, you uh, yes. before you matched it. And um, so then I, I uh, they transferred me to be the chief economics correspondent, the Treasury Department. Wow. And this was uh, sort of this is now uh, early 90s. Netscape's just been invented. Yeah. Um, this thing called the I in Internet. <laughs> you know, remember when Bill Clinton was president, like the president, no one had email. OK, yeah. there was, no yeah. one had heard of email. Yeah. So, um, and this thing called g -g 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 globalization was a morning. And right. um, so I was at the Treasury Department, just as we were kind of shifting from General Powell to General Electric, you know, in terms <laughs> of our, our kind of concerns. And you have a knack for uh, words. Yeah, I, I don't know I where it comes from. It's, uh, they yes. tell me that. So you should put that um, I should write. Yes. Uh, um, and so I did that for three years, and then uh, they made me the foreign affairs columnist, and I've been doing that ever since. And then I came here yesterday. So you came um, here yesterday, and uh, I, and I think this is destiny because you talk about these life moments. One discovering yeah. the op-ed, how you could communicate, and then all of these other experiences. You know, there's this form factor called the YouTube video. Yes, <laughs> which I think some organizations could get you, could you making some videos. A about absolutely, I, I know I should do that, and I, I thought of doing a MOOC. You know, it's, it's funny. So I, I um, my my youngest daughter went to Williams College, and Williams has, is on the four one four system. And this is relevant now for Khan Academy, I think, mm -hmm. which is that, so the one is a winter term, which is kind of fun. So you take yeah. winemaking, trip to Morocco, but as a freshman, you have to do, uh, you have to stay on campus. Right. So um, in a shameless effort to be near my daughter, I agreed, because uh, I had a friend there who was teaching a, a course on teaching, actually. I agreed to teach a course on how to write a column. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it, was, it was really fun for, for one reason, I realized that, um, like I've learned about globalization yeah. and written about it, I've learned about the Middle East and I've written about it, but I know how to write a column. <laughs> and it was really fun to write about something you know really deeply and right. to teach it. Right. So the way the course was constructed, I created a little book um, uh, for the class and you had to, because I did team taught it with a friend of mine who was an educator, so you had to, you had to teach a lesson, yeah. okay, on Tuesday, and then you had to write a column off that lesson on Thursday. And mm -hmm. I would come to class, and they would email their columns ahead of time, and then I would deconstruct them in front of them. Mm -hmm. Saying, you know, the 18th graph is really the lead, the lead is really uh, the kicker, you know, and I yeah, showed them, yeah, yeah. I kind of take it apart for them. So um, what I did, though, was I created a six, or seven chapter book, I guess, on how to write a column. And I just did this mimeograph, you know, but um, because my view is that there's actually just six kind of columns. And if you write a column that gets any one of these six reactions, you have a column. Right. So, and then I give examples of all six. Yeah. And the last chapter was Tom Friedman is a big fat idiot, right wing pinko, left wing bottom dwelling slug. <laughs> I took a day's or a week's blogs about me <laughs> and I put them all in one chapter, you know, right. about what a flaming jerk I am. Yeah. Um, and just to explain to people that being a columnist is not a friend growth industry <laughs> and um, uh, that you want my life are you ready for chapter seven okay <laughs> because you better be ready for chapter seven because I live with that Greek chorus every day okay right. um, so uh, so the six kind of columns are if so if you write a column that produces one of these six reactions you got a column the first is someone reads it and says I didn't know that that's a column yeah you tell people something they didn't know from reporting you know you yeah. report something I, wow I, I didn't know that Second is, I never looked at it that way. You give people a new perspective. Yeah, I, saw, I, ne I never looked at it that way. Third, your favorite, you live for this, happens half a dozen times a year if you're lucky. You said exactly what I felt, but I didn't know how to say, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. 
The fourth is I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring, okay? Yes. Because your column is defined as much by people who are against it as Have who are for it. Have you had people actually write that to you? Oh yeah, that's, really? that's nothing. I mean, that's, that's the nothing. nice that's stuff, <laughs> okay? I'd like to dance on your grave, you know? Really, um, people have written that? Uh, oh, you get, you oh, get oh everything. Um, but you really need to, you know, if you don't take chances, if you don't, you know, you, so you gotta, you gotta be able to take people on and yeah. be taken on. Yeah, you know? yeah. um, the fifth, very hard, do not try this trick at home, kids. Um, you made me laugh, you made me cry. Very hard to do. When you do it well, oh wow, it really works. Yeah. When you do it badly, yeah. bad humor or bad sort of sentimentality yeah. is cringe inducing. So <laughs> don't try that one unless you're really gonna pull it off. And last is what I simply call you challenged me. Right. And that is when a columnist challenges his own readers, which I believe in doing. I, right. I do a lot of that. And, and um, th so to me, if you write, and I give examples of all six. So if you write one of those kind of six columns, you got a column. And you target one or do you just go around and think about what you want to write, you write it, and then you, and then you say, oh, that's category three with a little bit of four. No, I'm not thinking about it yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, because yeah, I, I know, yeah. so in you my head, intuitively, I know, yeah. I know what it is. So right now, I've got actually three columns wrestling yeah. in my head. Um, excuse me, before I came here, I, I tracked down um, Ambassador Ryan Crocker and a yeah. plane in LaGuardia after yeah. I talked to you. Because yeah. um, I had a thought about Syria that was triggered by something he wrote in the Washington Post this, excuse me, this morning. Um, I'm thinking about some of the things you said yeah. because it melds well with a McKinsey study that somebody sent me yesterday. Yeah. And um, I did a um, column with a bunch of healthcare innovators last week at HHS. I did research for it, so I got that in my head. Yeah. Sometime tomorrow I'll make a commitment for Sunday. Yeah. But right now all three are wrestling and um, I'm carrying all three around in my head. To be a columnist you have to, I see columns everywhere, like I would need an hour here yeah. and I could at least get a column or two out of right, this, you know. Right. And if I didn't, you'd kind of die, like, because I do this right, twice a week, right, you know, right, it's right. like, what am I going to write for Wednesday? <laughs> it was Sundays. I have no idea what right, I'm going to write right, for Sunday, right. right? I really don't have any idea. Right. All I know is I've got a four-hour plane flight on, on Friday and I will write whatever I'm going to write for <laughs> Sunday on that four-hour plane ride, okay? I will make a commitment then, but, um, so I never worry about the ideas, it's more which one to choose of the ideas I have, you know. Right. So um, that's uh, so we will try to convince you to get your course on Khan Academy. Yeah, I would love to. I've really it thought will about reach doing millions. No, I really thought about yes. doing a, a MOOC, you know, yes. um, or or, or um, you know uh, something for you guys because it would be uh, your great be grandchildren fun. will learn to write a column. It's um, through, it's uh, it would be it would be a great honor. So, mm -hmm. and, and 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 what's I mean throughout all of this? I mean once again, I mean a million a million different things. I mean, I mean just going from the first question of how you got started. I mean, what's interesting about it is you just started doing your career and, right. and that's what led, it's, nowhere in that did someone look at your resume and say. No, all oh. I, all, well they did, they saw that I went to Oxford, I studied right. you know, yeah, Arabic that's and all. Impressive. So yeah. that, was, that was a door opener. Yeah. But what really got me in was I wrote, I had a dozen columns to show. Right. So whatever young journalist come to me and say, I want to do what you do, you know. Um, they say, what do I need to do what you do? Yeah. And when I say, well, you know, the first thing you need is that you be able to type fast. I can type really fast. Um, <laughs> take good notes. Um, you need to know English. You know, obviously, good yeah, grammar. And, and try good grammar. Yeah. Punctual with comma goes there. Yeah. You know, good to know some economics, politics, history, all those things. Science, environment. But there's actually just one thing you need to be a good journalist. I believe you have to like people. Right. Um, you have to really enjoy sitting with them and listening to the crazy things they say and do and the incredible music of their lives. And if you cannot hear the music, you'll never be able to play the music. And I really do like people. I love interviewing them. I interview them wherever I go. And, um, uh, and so I'm struck at how many journalists hate people. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I've known of several of them. Um, but I really do like people and I enjoy hearing the music of their lives. I have an unnamed friend who was in residency for surgical residency mm. and he really brilliant guy yeah. and he got some negative feedback from one of the senior residents and the feedback was you know it really just doesn't look like you care about the patients and he was really taking like, that to heart yeah and then I asked him well, well do you care he's like no yeah that's right that's right <laughs> it's like well that's right that's right, that's right. Maybe, it maybe comes that's to an issue. it shows maybe, maybe, maybe it shows. that's an issue there you know I mean I was in the, I was in San Francisco yesterday and I went to Starbucks because I needed some free wireless because I my wireless was out so I just was going in there and a woman a guy came out and said we have to buy you coffee um you know big fans yada yada 
And so I immediately said, well, what do you do? What do you do? Oh, you're in big data analysis. Fascinating. Give me your card. By 4.30, I met with them again. I bought them a drink and All interviewed right. them. And so the, there's one good thing about notoriety. If people throw shit at you, true. Yeah. That's, you know, they want to dance on your that's grave. That's right. But they want to yeah. dance on your grave. Yeah. But a lot of other people want to come up and tell you about their lives and what they do. And they are just, I cannot tell you how many column stories and ideas I've gotten from people who just come up to me on the street, in an airport, in a Starbucks, and, um, and tell you things about, uh, about their lives. So it's, uh, I'm really open to that. Um, I'm still tickled when someone comes up to me and, and says something. I, I think that's pretty serious. If someone stops you and says, I want to tell you how I feel about what you're doing, you know what I mean? And so, so you I'm, invite that. I mean, I really, there, I welcome so you. See yeah. Tom Friedman in an airport. Yeah, the people do it. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, a lot of times people come up and say, you know, I agree with about 90% of what you write. Yeah. And I say, hey, that's like a perfect number for me because it means you're always going to check. Yeah. Um, I, death for a columnist is if yeah. people say, I know what he or she is going to write. Right. Why should I read it? Like, I don't know what I'm going to write half the time because my column is very um, non-ideological and very reporting centric because I'm still a reporter. I believe the best columnists are, are always reporters. And um, I think it's actually true in every profession. Because I always tell you, I, I've had colleagues who say, like, I want to do what you do, I only do analysis now. Yeah. To which I say, your analysis must not be very good because all my analysis grows out of my reporting. Mm. It's only when you're working with the clay that you see the patterns, you feel the texture, and that's where the column comes from. And you find it difficult to kind of maintain ground, you know, you put, a, you, say you put an op-ed and you get a, bunch of people on a message board just saying, oh, you're this, that, you're this, that. Does that affect you? Does it, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I do need to move more. So to it's right a really left. complicated thing. Um, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. Um, um, uh, Cause I, I just be overwhelmed. So the signal to noise ratio now is the noise is so high that you, um, you can't, no human being, um, you know, people tell you, I've got a thick skin. It doesn't bother me. Yeah. I've never met that person. So anytime people are, in large numbers saying bad things about you. Um, you, you, by the way, many people say the opposite. Yeah, I, no, you, no, you know what I mean? yes, so, no. But I don't, so I don't want to exaggerate it. Yeah. But here's what I find kind of about the comment section of the Times, because uh, we have comments under our columns. So today there are maybe 400 comments, you know. yeah. And um, you always have to be careful because the Times online, which is where people comment, has a little bit of a left bias. Mm -hmm. Who reads the New York Times? Then who reads it online? Yeah. You know, it's going to be a younger, more left to center audience. So you got to be aware of that for yeah. starters. And, um, but you know, very often I confess, I go to the closet, I yeah. put on my uh, wetsuit, I <laughs> fix the helmet to my head, you know, <laughs> and I dive into the, um, uh, 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 to the, to the um, comments because I'll tell you, you find a lot, they're predictable, you're this, you're that, they're, they're nasty, they're personal, whatever. But I'll tell you something, invariably when I do it, I come across one, two, or three that are brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I just and I, I literally cut and paste them in my notebook and say I got to right. remember this. This right. is brilliant, and that's the beauty of crowdsourcing. Wow. So you just it yeah. comes with the um, it just comes with the territory. You know you you're by the way you're out there dishing it out. You got to be able to take it. So I'm right. a big believer in right. that. I, so you don't see I'm not in the internet wars. Like you'll never see me, you know, fighting. Be, yeah. You know, with uh, because my attitude is um, I got my say. You got your say, and. Um, uh, I'm not going to prove you're right. You're going to, you know, 10 years ago, I wrote the world is flat. So yeah. since then, people have written books, you know, the world is not flat. This whole library, curved, the whole library, the world is curved, the yes. world is spiky, lumpy, chunky, <laughs> you know. And, um, uh, and people always said, like, do what, did you, what did you say about that book? And my attitude is to everybody, and this isn't arrogance, it's like, look, I'm either going to be right or wrong, but we're not going to know for 10 years. Okay, so come to me in 10 years. And, and I'd say 10 years later, yeah, I got one big thing wrong. It is so much flatter than I thought. Right. And this place is surfing on that, you know, what happened, you know, so. So I actually, I, I, was, I mean, you, you were just saying right before we were chatting about this, I mean, your most recent op-ed piece. Yeah. Oh, uh, tell, tell us about it, because I think that does start to connect with, with what we're trying to do here. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the what would really connect, I, I, I'll start at just one 10,000-foot uh, layer higher, you know, which is, because um, I really like to think of what I do as uh, being a plumber that I'm always interested in where the plumbing is. So I spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and always have, because yeah. I'm very interested in where the technology is going, what it's enabling, what it's empowering, and what it's not. And so that's really what, what, uh, what produced the world is flat. Um, so, I mean, may I just tell that story just for a second, because it's, it's, it's relevant. Yeah, yeah. Um, so after 9-11, I spent three years in the, um, uh, in the Arab Muslim world trying to understand the roots of 9-11. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I wrote From Beirut to Jerusalem, then 10 years later I wrote probably one of the first big books about globalization it's called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. Mm. Okay, that came out in the late 90s, and then um, I put that subject down after 9-11 and really focused on trying to understand the roots of 9-11. I also started doing documentaries then for the Discovery Channel. So mm. Discovery Channel and New York Times created a partnership. Yeah. I did a documentary after 9-11 called The Roots of 9-11, which I was very proud of, and um, I did one then on um, the wall, Israel built in the West Bank, and in February 2004, we were sitting around with our discovery team, what should we do our next documentary on? And uh, Kerry was running against um, uh, um, Bush for, for president, and um, at the time, I, my idea was, let's do a documentary about why everybody hates America. Thought, you know, that was a hot subject. Bush mm. was president, mm. running for re-election. Why does everybody hate us? Mm. And um, so how should we do that? Well, I had this crazy idea, we should go to outsourcing centers all over the world and interview young people who spend their days imitating Americans <laughs> on what they think of America. Yeah. I thought it'd make a fascinating double yeah, mirror. Yeah, yeah. You know, Zhao by day, John by night. Yes. You know, Juan by day, Joe yeah. by night. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so we literally were budgeting that documentary. Where do we go? Guatemala, Mexico City, Philippines, Bangalore. And in the middle of that budget debate, John Kerry came out with his blast against Benedict Arnold CEOs mm -hmm. who engage in outsourcing. Because yeah. we just had the Y2K thing, outsourcing was just becoming a yeah. big issue. So I came to the Times, I said, time out, why don't we do a documentary just called The Other Side of Outsourcing and explain this phenomenon to people. Yeah. And I know Nanda Nilakani had emphasis and I could go to Bangalore. They liked that, I just go ahead. Yeah. Um, that was the days when people had money. <laughs> and so, um, uh, and so we went to Bangalore and we spent two weeks there. Now I had just come off really three years covering 9-11. And I'd written this book on globalization in the late 1990s. And I spent two weeks in Bangalore and I realized, I just kept walking around South saying, I don't understand the platform that's allowing this. I saw people, I met people ready to, to trace my lost luggage on Delta Airlines from Bangalore, yeah. read my x-rays from Bangalore. Um, do my taxes from Bangalore. Now this all seems now yeah, normal, yeah, but sure, back yeah. then it was like yeah. mind blowing. So the last interview was with Nanda Nilakani, the CEO of Infosys, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, sort of Microsoft of India, and he'd been out of the country those two weeks and he'd just come back. I went to his office at Electronic City and Infosys to see him. We sat on the couch outside his office. I had my laptop on my lap. And um, at one point he said, Tom, I gotta tell you, the global economic playing field is being leveled and you Americans are not ready. Mm. Oh, I wrote that down on my little laptop. <laughs> the global economic playing field being leveled. You have to be careful when you, you talk Ameri to right. yeah. You Americans are not ready, and it just really blew my mind. You know, I mean, it sort of, it connected a lot of things. So I got done with the interview, I got back in my Jeep to go back to um, my hotel, and uh, it's about an hour drive from Electronic City back to Bangalore, and I'm thinking now the whole time what Nanda said, the global economic playing field is being leveled. Wow, he's really saying the global economic playing field is being flattened. Mm. Wow, I think he just told me the world is flat. Yeah. And so I wrote that in my notebook. Yeah. The world is flat. Yeah. I got back to my hotel room, I literally ran up to my room, and I called my wife in Bethesda and said, honey, I'm gonna write a book called The World is Flat. She now says she thought that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> that is not exactly how I recall the conversation. Okay. I'm looking at my wife. Okay. We, we have, but um, no, no, I'm, but uh, I, uh, I, I, did, I immediately came, I got so excited about it. It was Nandan's 50th birthday party. Yeah. i never forget this. And I was going back to his house for dinner. He had a Simon and Garfunkel duo, imitation duo. <laughs> he was so excited about the idea. He had all his Bangalore tech pals. He Was he Simon or Garfunkel? Uh, that's right. He, he was, he was he, singing. No, 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 he had, okay, he had uh, just an imitation duo. I'll let that pass, yeah. Um, and, but he, uh, Nandan was so excited about it, he wanted me to, I, now it was on, I, I literally had sketched out on the back of an envelope, kind of the uh, just rough, crude yeah. outline of a book. And he wanted me to present it at his birthday party to his Bangalore. Wow. He was so excited about it. But I got home, I called the Times, I said, I have to go and leave immediately. My software's out of date. I'm a basic engineer and it's a Java world. Yeah. And if you don't give me a leave immediately, I I'm gonna write something really stupid in the New York yeah. Times. Because yeah. my, my software is a great way to get a leave. So my software was out of date. Yeah. And uh, so they basically did. They said, go you know, as soon as you can. So I went on, went on leave in, in July. And um, uh, that um, July, I, uh, I, I went, I was invited to the Allen Conference in Sun Valley. They had invited me a bunch, and I'd, I just never could work it out to go. But, um, and so then I had it really on the back of an envelope, but it was more fleshed out, and they asked me to make a presentation. Bill Gates was in the audience. 
And he heard it, and he uh, came up afterwards. He had taken all these notes, Bill. And he said, that was, that was really interesting. And I said, yeah, no. You're, you're talking to me? Exactly. I, mean, I told you something about you know, <laughs> this that you didn't know? And um, he said, uh, um, uh, oh, no, I knew all of that. I just never put it together. Oh, he was like a class four or yeah, whatever. Yeah, just like he said. Pieces. Yeah, <laughs> he said, I never you know, connected all those things. He said, you're 90% there, and I'm going to help you with the last 10%. Wow. And, well, that, uh, this yeah. is interesting because at you know, that point, right when the Mentor, book came out. I mean, just, oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And he's obviously played a huge yeah. role here as well. But that, I mean, that's what it, the outsourcing craze. People were scared. Everything's going to go to India and China. Right. And it seems like we're kind of that post-fear phase yes. right now. And it's true. A lot of stuff is still going to that part of the world. But if you look at the U.S., uh, software engineer salaries continue to go right. through through the roof. Right, yeah. um, you I mean look here, at is everyone's salary going through every, the roof? I, 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 <laughs> your salaries are going through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They, I mean, they legitimately are. Yeah. Um, you, you have more and more innovation is actually being focused in 20 miles around yes. here. Uh, we have a great American, car, you know, Tesla yeah. now. I mean, yeah. how do we compare these two things? The, this, this notion between the U.S. is losing its edge, everything's being outsourced, and it looks like more innovation is being focused in the U.S. now. So let's go to what happened um, between 2004 and today. Because yeah. um, uh, I think that's the story, that between 2004 and today, uh, something big happened, call it Flat World 2.0, I call it the Great Inflection. Yeah. But um, there was a merger of globalization and the IT revolution. Mm -hmm. They kind of merged in a way, that more IT drove more globalization, more globalization drove the expansion of more IT and they merged. And so something really big happened, so in my view. We went from a connected world to a hyper-connected world. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's changing everything. And Khan Academy is now on that platform. So, you know, the, the story I uh, tell my, my soundbite is that um, when I wrote The World is Flat, um, so when I wrote my last book, which is about America, um, which is in 2011, the first thing I did was go back and get the first edition of The World is Flat off my bookshelf, yeah. just to remind myself yeah, what yeah, I'd written. Yeah. And um, I took it off the shelf. I opened it up to the index, looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, F, A. Facebook wasn't in it. Mm. So when I was running around the world saying, the world is flat, right. we're all connected. Yeah. Facebook didn't exist. Twitter yeah. was still a sound. The cloud <laughs> was still in the sky. 4G was a parking place. LinkedIn was a prison. <laughs> Applications were what you <laughs> sent to college. Big data was a rap star. And Skype was a typo. Okay. <laughs> I mean, all of that happened yeah. after I wrote The World is yeah. Flat, yeah. you know? So what does that tell you? Yeah. It tells you we've gone from a connected world to a hyper-connected world. Right. So what are the features of that? Well, yeah. the features of that is that more people now can compete, connect, collaborate, and invent with more other people yeah. um, in more different ways, from more different places, for less money than ever before. Right. And it reached a difference of degree, so that's a difference of kind, that allows for Khan Academy. Yeah. That for basically zero marginal costs, you can now offer the greatest educational lessons to anyone you know, in the world with a yeah. web-enabled cell phone or, or an or a, a internet-enabled computer. But what's your sense of why, I mean, just like the talent, you know, the offshoring fear was that all the software engineering jobs are gonna go to India. What's your sense of why we, see, we actually saw the opposite? Actually, now we're seeing finally uh, uh, an inflection yes. point where software engineers are trying to become competitive with bankers and consultants and, and, and other types of people in terms of income. And uh, I mean, what, what do you think is allowing for that despite the globalization phenomenon? Well, you know, the way I always like to explain it is that there isn't something called a lump of labor. Right. We've got it and now India's gonna get it, bring right. the lump back. That's right. not how it works, okay? Right. So the best way I could explain, well, I used to explain it when I talk about the world is flat is, um, Guess what? Not everything that needs to be invented has been invented. Right. And the example I always give is uh, your daughter goes off to college. My daughter goes off to college. Um, um, and uh, your, your kid goes off to college, comes back after first semester, and you say, yeah, so honey, um, what do you think I'm majoring in? What do you think you're going to do? Um, she says, Dad, I want to be a search engine optimizer when I grow up. I say, what the? I sent you to college. You couldn't be an ophthalmologist or an accountant. What the hell is a search engine optimizer? Of course. So here's an industry that came from zero to multi-billion dollars. Right. How do we optimize my website? So if Saul's in the tennis shoe business and Tom's in the tennis shoe business, when I put tennis shoes into Google, Tom's tennis shoes comes up before Saul's tennis yeah. shoes. Um, it is now a multi-billion dollar industry that's a mashup, by the way, between math and Madison Avenue. Yeah. So it brings together advertising people with, uh, with mathematicians. 
whole new field for people with software or math degrees, yeah. never existed before. Right. And so Khan Academy, the software around distributed online courses, didn't exist 10 years ago, you know? Um, and so all these things keep getting invented. But there's one constant, it seems to me, Sal, and that's every good job is either going out, up, or down faster than ever. Mm. That is, it, every good job either requires more education to do, or it can be done by more people, computers, or software, yeah. or it's being outsourced to the past yeah. faster. So every job is going in all three directions. Yeah, at maybe once, not more you know? education in the formal sense. It could no, be exactly. More, more competency. Competency. That's creativity, a good. That's a very good. Exactly. You might wanna, exactly. exactly. You might wanna One thing we know it. about search engine optimizer: you needed to know more than you did, um, you know, to be a computer repair person. Yeah. You know, and so. Um, but but what I think is exciting about this moment, and again, this is all being, I would argue, enabled by the hyper-connected platform, is that once it becomes a competency game. I can acquire those competencies in any way. Mm -hmm. And that's what people don't appreciate about globalization. I, th I always say globalization giveth and globalization taketh. Mm -hmm. Globalization just made the qualifications for this job higher and it just brought you Khan Academy where my daughter who is applying you know, for graduate school can go to to get prep for her GREs for free. Well, she did. She did. You told me. Exactly. I hope she got her money's worth. And she did. Money. <laughs> she got in. <laughs> she <laughs> yeah. got in. Oh, actually, She's there she right now. She visited here two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, so it's, do it's doing both at the same time. And if you miss that, if you think it's all bad or all good, all right. you don't get it. Yeah. And the, sort of the debate around globalization tends to be that, oh my God, it's terrible. It's going to kill us. It's going to overwhelm us. Or it's wonderful. Yeah. It's great. No, it, it's disruptive. It's creative destruction on steroids but the opportunities it's unleashing for all different kinds of people. Um, and so the, my, my sort of overall summary of it is that we're going from a, f we're, we're moving into a 401k world where everyone will have to pass the bar exam and no one will be able to escape the most email list. So versus the pension world. Exactly, it's so defined. basically, you, we're going from a world of defined benefits. Yes, to defined, pension world. That's the defined contributions. For 30 years, I worked for the New York Times. I had a defined benefit. Mm -hmm. Every year, really, it didn't matter. You know, it, I mean, it was obviously tied to my performance in general, but basically, I got a defined benefit from the yeah. New York Times. Yeah. Now I get a defined contribution. They'll give me X amount of money, and I have to take responsibility yeah. for investing it wisely. Yeah. So I think that's happening to the whole labor market. We're going yeah. from a world of defined benefits where you kind of be protected by walls you and floors. You go to college, you're fine. You're, you're going to get a job. Exactly. You're going to get a, that four-year yeah. degree is a proxy yeah, exactly. for a key in the door of a job. That's right. Okay. No, now it's, we're, we're in a world of defined contributions. The great thing for all the people on Khan Academy is there's no ceiling anymore. It ain't going to matter in all five students, years all whether you went to Stanford there, yeah. or you got those competencies on Khan The ceiling's yeah. gone. But what's really scary, so are the floors and walls. Right. You know, and right. so we're going from a defined benefit world to a defined contribution world. That's what the hyperconnectivity yeah. does. Second. Real global meritocracy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, anyone will be able to anyone compete. Anyone will be able to right. compete. Right. Second, it's a world where, and, be, and be, what will enable that is we're moving to a world where everyone will have to pass the bar. Yeah. That is, in the old days, we said, your three years at Stanford Law School, or well, that, maybe 100 years, we said, Going to law school was a proxy for knowing the law. At yeah. some point, the legal profession said, no, no, we're gonna, you're going to go to law school, but then you have to take the bar Literally that says bar. you actually know yeah. what you know. That is coming, I think, to every industry. Yeah. You want to get a job across the street at Google? I don't think you just show up there and say, I have a BA in engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they test, yes. do you actually know what you know? You know yeah. Because you know, Tony Wagner always says, the world doesn't really care what you know, because the Google machine knows everything. Okay? The world only pays off on what you can do with what you know, and right. we are now going to test that. Right. So my motto is, everyone's going to have to pass the bar. Yeah. Third, we all are going to have our own most emailed machine. So New York Times, go to NewYorkTimes.com, any day, you have the most email columns, changes every 15 minutes. Yeah. Any journalist who says they don't look at it is lying, okay? <laughs> um, you always want to see where your story, your column, whatever, yeah. did it go up to the most email list? Yeah. Human nature. I think what's coming is a most email list is coming to a job near you because with big data, so we had a story in the New York Times that Jamba Juice has technology, it's installed, it's in place, where they can measure which employees sell the most juice on Fifth Avenue and 63rd Street at 80 degrees, wow. between 8 and 10 in the morning. And because they also divide their workday in 15 minute increments, the employees who do that get the most overtime. 
Wow. They've got their most email list now. If you go to schoolloop.com in your world, you can track your kid's school assignment, what he, she or she, you know, whether she turned it in on time, by the way, whether he or she is tardy, yeah. you know, and you can, the kids now have their most email list. So yeah. these are all most email lists that will connect to your performance and display it in real time. And look, it's all scary, it's scary to me. You know. And in this world, I mean, some people would fear that, okay, this is going to become very automatic, very, you know, okay, these things matter, how productive were you at yeah. the Jamba Juice. But what about, what about the soft skills, the, the arts even, and, and the arts impact on society as a whole, participation in democracy, some of these things that don't translate into dollars at Jamba Juice? So I think those are, again, more important than ever because what this world really enables, if you are a self-motivated person and you're living in a world at Khan Academy, if you are a self-motivated kid, in, um, uh, in Khan Afghanistan, and there's Khan Academy, and I've got an internet connection, you can suddenly, you can go to the moon. Yeah. There's no, do you, do you think of the walls and ceilings that person lived within? And so that is just really exciting if you are self-motivated. If you are not self-motivated, the walls and, and floors that protected you are gone. And so I think the most important kind of leadership for a company um, and leadership in the, and for teachers and for parents and for coaches is education that inspires. Yeah. Those soft skills, love of learning, motivation, they are gonna matter hugely more. in a world, more than ever, so because when everything is out there now, for you, for free, if you access it, you know, and so, and that's, that's sort of one side of the soft skills, but also, look, it's great to know math and physics and calculus and programming, and you can't be creative without them. Um, but uh, poetry, music, mm -hmm. jazz, sports, collaboration, all those things that um, inspire people to take the math and turn it into a, something of beauty, of uh, something that will make people's lives more productive, more healthy, more entertained, more caring, that all comes from the other stuff. So I think the pendulum swung pretty far to this way um, in terms of rigorous skill, hard skills. I think we need to make sure it, we come back to the middle here um, and that we're blending. When we say blended model, we don't just mean teacher as a tutor more and a coach and all the online stuff taking care of the rest, but blending also all these other things. And if I read between the lines when you talk about these new industries, the difference between the engineering jobs that are going to India and the ones that are the salaries are increasing here, is that it's, it's fundamentally right-brained. Oh, it's, it's fundamentally creative, creative, Madison Avenue Absolutely. plus. Absolutely. You're not, rem India got into this game by remediating Y2K computers. Right. Now what's cool to me about what's going on in India a decade later um, is we're seeing, um, so when I wrote about The World is Flat in 2004, that was really based on Indians solving our problems. Yeah. Y2K. Now what's so exciting with this platform, they're using these incredibly cheap tools of connectivity and collaboration and the cloud to solve their problems. Yeah. So if you look at what innovators in Mexico or India are doing, it's an explosion of innovation. We've got a, mil a billion more brains that potentially can be applied against the biggest problems yeah. of humanity. Yeah. And if that doesn't float your boat, then there's something <laughs> wrong with you. Now, at the same time, I understand the challenge. And um, uh, we should get them to figure out how we can solve the outsourcing problem. Well, it's, 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 um, they might do that in a certain <laughs> yeah. way. Don't put it past yeah. them. Um, and I understand for a lot of people it's scary. If you're a 50 year old guy or gal in a declining industry and somebody comes and says, no problem, you can, you'll, you can thrive, just go to Khan Academy yeah. and take their lessons. I have huge sympathy for that. That's just so out of their, They've been protected by a wall and a floor. They didn't do this. You know, um, you can use all my tax dollars you want to help those people and make a transition. Yeah. What we shouldn't do is, though, is block the change. Yeah. You know, if horses could vote, there never would have been cars. All right? It's <laughs> always important to remember that. And so <laughs> if, you, if you try to stand in the way of the change... That would be a fun party game. If horses could, could be vote. Could vote. Right, vote. What would there be? What would else? What yes. would not, what wouldn't there be and what would Interesting. there be? I love the way your mind yes. works. So it's... Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's, because um, then you won't have the resources to take care yes. of people. But I have a huge sympathy for people caught in that transition. Right. Um, and no one should ever mistake, I get very excited talking about things I discover, yeah. just connections I make. 
but do not mistake my excitement for just, I love the puzzle, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Wow, that explains this and this explains that. Um, and people should know that, that this is happening. But don't, don't confuse it for unsympathy or right. even that I'm not even net worried about all of this. That I see the upside and the downside, but it leaves me net worried right. in many ways. Wow. I'm going to ask you one last question. Go ahead. Where are you going next? You, you hinted on it a little bit, and I, I found that fascinating because you're doing two documentaries almost at the same time. Well, I'm doing, it's, one, it's the same documentary. It's called Climate Change in the Arab Spring. It's for the um, uh, Showtime channel. It's part of a six-part climate uh, series they're going to run next year. I'm um, going to Yemen on Sunday to um, look at uh, Yemen, the first country in the world that will probably run out of water. Wow. Um, you, you can go around Sana, you see water trucks all wow. over the place. Unfortunately, the country is, has a big addiction to cot, this uh, to, plant, to cot, cot, QAT, it's a drug. Oh, wow. I mean, it's a yeah. plant that uh, is a mild narcotic, mm. but it consumes a lot of water. Mm. And um, uh, somebody told me they were on a high level, you know, presidential visit or uh, the, pres the president of their country, the secretary of state of their country, and they went with the president of Yemen somewhere and the pilot of the helicopter was chewing cot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, Kind of leave me a little worried. Yeah. Get on American <laughs> Airlines. And yeah, and their pilot <laughs> spits out a pile of cot on the floor. Well, yeah. Um, but uh, and then we're going to Syria because people don't realize Syria had a 10-year drought, yeah. um, worst drought in in their history, on recorded history. Um, as the lead up to this, a million farmers and grazers had to leave the countryside, move to the cities, put huge pressure on the infrastructure, and it didn't cause the revolution there, but it was one of the stresses that really yeah. helped yeah. contribute to it. And we'll be going to Egypt because um, uh, in 2010, in December 2010, um, there was a huge spike in global wheat prices um, uh, because there was a drought in Australia, there was a drought in Russia, um, and uh, there was a drought in China. Or flood, what may, uh, flooding in Australia, drought in China, drought in Russia. And uh, as a result, global wheat prices spiked. Um, yeah. In December 2010, the exact same time of the revolution, wow. um, the Arab Spring, the Arab, the Arab Spring, Spring yeah. uh, exactly. Tunisia and Egypt. Then, um, world food prices hit a record high the month of the Tunisian Revolution. Wow! And uh, remember, the guy who, who started the revolution in Tunisia was a fruit seller. Wow! Uh, he was a vegetable seller. Excuse me. And um, so these didn't cause the Arab Spring, but they were huge stresses they on the system. Accelerated, catalyzed. And it yeah. shows you that. Um, you know, why you should take climate change very seriously. Wow. Well, on that note, fairly epic note, yeah. you know, <laughs> not quite positive, but it, this has been a huge honor, I think, for all of us at the team. Great fun for me. Thank you so much for coming. Real treats, Sal. Thank you very yeah. much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.